start off for today, just to let you know where we're going. Um, first, Carmen is going to speak on reasonable notice and what the courts are doing with uh, wrongful dismissal cases, um, some interesting case law in terms of the direction uh, that the courts are going. And then after Carmen has scared you with the common law, I'm going to pick it up with uh, employment contracts and things to do and things, quite frankly, not to do with employment contracts. Um, then Carmen is going to pick it back up with the fascinating Just Cause update and um, in particular a look at the off-duty conduct issue, uh, which is, uh, as we all know from media reports, gaining in kind of momentum and concern for employers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carmen uh, for the reasonable notice. Marvelous. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so as Jeff said, we're, we're getting started with a bit of a primer on reasonable notice. Um, and this is by way of sort of building you up gradually over the next hour and a half to the salacious topic of off-duty conduct. <laughs> so we're going to get, get the basics down first. Um, and this will be very familiar to most of you. But in essence, uh, employer obligations upon terminating an employee are sort of twofold. So first we have obviously the statutory notice obligations. Um, any employer who's terminating an employee on a without cause basis uh, is required to comply with the minimum standards that are set out in the Employment Standards Act. So this will include statutory notice of termination and benefit continuation, and that's approximately one week per year of service up to a maximum of eight weeks. And then in some cases, uh, for those employees who have sufficient service and uh, where the employer has got a big enough payroll, essentially, there will also be a statutory severance pay obligations. So we have that one category, which is your stat obligations. And then on top of those, we've got uh, uh, the, the all too familiar common law reasonable notice obligations. Um, and essentially, absent a valid and enforceable termination clause, there is an implied obligation uh, to provide common law reasonable notice of termination to employees. And to be clear, these there are two sort of categories of entitlements. We're talking about statutory and common law, but where you're looking at uh, common law reasonable notice, that subsumes the, uh, the statutory notice period as well. So you're not going to be um, sort of adding common law reasonable notice on top of statutory. That will be subsumed. Um, the rationale, as we know, that underlies the common law reasonable notice requirement is essentially to provide employees with sufficient opportunity to seek alternate employment. That is the practical function of the common law reasonable notice period. Um, as we know, the common law reasonable notice period often <laughs> takes the form of cash now <laughs> instead of actual notice of termination, but that is the underlying rationale. And the practical reality, uh, again, as everybody is well aware, is that the common law reasonable notice um, requirement basically uh, increases the costs quite significantly that are associated with a termination. So that sets out the landscape for you of the two categories of obligations that employers are dealing with. Now when we zero in on the calculation of the common law reasonable notice period, um, you know, our statutory entitlements and our statutory obligations are fairly easy to ascertain. Um, whereas the common law reasonable notice period is really more of an, an art than a science. However, we still have the seminal Bartle factors <laughs> that assist us in determining <laughs> what the appropriate reasonable notice period is for an employee. So those factors are the employee's age, the employee's length of service, the character of the employment, uh, so this includes the type of work that's being performed, the degree of expertise associated with the employee's position, uh, and also the compensation level, and the availability of alternate uh, or comparable employment. And then there's, uh, there's also sort of a, a subsequent consideration which looks to the circumstances that surround the, the hiring. So in those instances where the employee has been induced or headhunted uh, into the position, that, that will also be taken into consideration. So this is essentially the basket of considerations that come into play um, when 
lawyers are trying to assess uh, a, an appropriate reasonable notice period, and these are the factors that will be considered by the court. So this was familiar ground to you, no doubt. Uh, and, but now we're going to move into a discussion of the, the recent <laughs> developments um, from sort of a practical litigation perspective. Uh, which we're calling here the herniac effect. Um, and so in 2014, the Supreme Court's decision in herniac and Malden uh, really changed the summary judgment landscape for everyone. So the summary judgment process, it's essentially a mechanism by which to uh, provide a, a more expedient, sort of expedited means of arriving at a judicial decision. So post herniac what we've seen uh, is that it's been become quite clear that the assessment of reasonable notice periods can be made on a motion for summary judgment where there aren't any other contentious issues so where there aren't any major factual disputes for example that would require uh, viva voce evidence or something uh, of that nature then in most cases uh, a judge will find that it is appropriate to make the what is ultimately a legal assessment of common law reasonable notice entitlements in the context of a motion for summary judgment. So what does that mean? Um, there are a couple of practical implications certainly. Um, because this summary judgment mechanism is available, and Jeff can certainly attest to the fact that uh, it's being used by plaintiff's counsel fairly aggressively. Um, so this is not an unusual occurrence by any stretch that a plaintiff counsel will move for summary judgment on the common law reasonable notice issue. But it does mean that uh, from a litigation perspective, it shifts some of the, the work to the front end of the litigation process because you're potentially going to be uh, appearing before a judge to determine reasonable notice in the absence of a discovery process, um, then it means that the, the affidavit of documents that you exchange will likely need to be uh, pretty fulsome because that will be essentially all that you have on the record um, when the time that the summary judgment motion rolls around. So it does shift some of the burden of the work uh, towards the front end of the process. And also a second consideration here is the effect of the summary judgment process on um, reasonable notice periods where you've got a decision from a judge um, before the actual reasonable notice period has expired. So given that we have an expedited process, we're not necessarily waiting a year for a trial to take place. You can have a motion um, heard in what, a couple, couple of months yeah. really following um, the comm commencement of the litigation. So in some circumstances, you've got a decision uh, and, and a damage award, presumably, where the employee is still within the reasonable notice period and ostensibly should still be seeking alternate employment and should still be attempting to mitigate those damages. So we're now seeing sort of divergent approaches uh, taken by the courts, whether this involves placing um, essentially the, the funds in a trust and waiting out the notice period to determine what happens, whether the employee has mitigated, and, and then trying to um, sort out the financial arrangements at the back end, or we've seen sort of a, an array. There's no one um, established approach, which adds a, a certain element <laughs> of uncertainty uh, to the process. So that's something also uh, that bears uh, keeping in mind. So essentially, reasonable notice update uh, in terms of the summary judgment process, the, the key takeaways are that this is a fairly common mechanism that's being used all too often by plaintiff counsel, and it does alter uh, the course of the litigation pretty significantly. So um, it just requires that we're all on our toes at an early stage of the game. So... I've already mentioned that assessing reasonable notice is really more uh, of an art than it is a science. But over the, you know, over the past, we'll say 10 years, 15 years, certain rules of thumb have emerged and are taken as givens um, by 
counsel, by HR professionals, um, all sorts of people. And so I think it, it's well worth revisiting some of the, the kind of commonly received rules of thumb and to take a quick look at whether, in fact, these rules of thumb can and should be relied upon. So the first is that in calculating um, or trying to assess a, a, an appropriate common law reasonable notice period for a given employee, uh, often people will say, well, it's, you know, it amounts to approximately one month per year of service. So that's one of the rules of thumb that we're going to take a look at. The second is that uh, there is a notional cap or a ceiling on common law reasonable notice awards. So often uh, people will think to themselves, okay, so it's approximately one month per year of service, but there's going to be a cap at 24. Because for a lot of years, you did see uh, courts being fairly hesitant to go beyond the 24-month um, award. And then finally, uh, the third rule of thumb that we're going to, going to take a quick look at is this uh, idea that employees are only bridged to age 65. So that is where an employee is terminated, let's say they're 64 years old and have long service with the employer. Uh, some of the received wisdom is that a court will only award them a sufficiently long reasonable notice period to bring them to what was commonly accepted as retirement age. So that effectively your, your common law reasonable notice award would have a cap if you had an employee who was approaching um, the, uh, the age of retirement. So these are easy rules of thumb to sort of fall back upon, but um, each is sort of a maxim that deserves a little, a little scrutiny. The first, um, talking about assuming that a common law reasonable notice period will be approximately one month per year of service. So what we've seen recently is that short service employees uh, often are awarded a disproportionately long notice period. So let's say you have an employee who has one year of service. Um, if you're falling back on the one month per year of service rule, then that would equal one, one month common law reasonable notice. But increasingly, we see situations where these short service employees are getting uh, quite lengthy relative to their service, uh, common law reasonable notice periods. So one example I have up there is COW and SBLR, where we see a six week, a six week employee um, who was terminated during a probationary period. Um, evidently, the employment relationship was not working out. Um, and it was a 90-day probationary period. And this employee was ultimately awarded four months notice. Um, so if we're you know, calling to mind the one month per year of service rule, obviously that did not um, come to fruition in this case. And, and this isn't certainly isn't an isolated incident. Um, if we think back to that rationale that we discussed in the first slide about common law reasonable notice, the, the intention is to provide this employee with sufficient time to seek alternate employment. And the, the calculus that the courts are taking is that uh, one month is not really all that realistic in terms of finding um, and securing alternate employment. And there's also a recognition that when you're looking at a, a short service employee um, and you're keeping in mind the effect of, let's say, six weeks employment on their CV, um, it's tough because <laughs> future employers are going to say, so, you know, so what happened that this, this uh, previous employer only kept you for X amount of time? So taking those factors into consideration, we're often seeing uh, lengthier reasonable notice periods for short service employees. Uh, another interesting development is the, the occasional uh, situations in which the court will actually take prevailing economic conditions into consideration. Now that is not one of the uh, clear Bartle factors, but there are a couple of more recent decisions out there wherein uh, the court will say, okay, so I've, I've assessed the usual Bartle factors and I've arrived at um, my um, estimation of an appropriate common law reasonable notice period. But given the depressed economic uh, situation 
of the employer in a few cases and in this Gristy decision particularly, I'm going to discount, that was literally the language the court used, I'm going to discount the co common law reasonable notice period um, by a month to take into account the fact that this particular employer employer is struggling and would likely have had to reduce the employee's hours in the near future anyhow. So that's an interesting development that we've seen. Um, the second rule of thumb we discussed was this 24-month cap um, or ceiling on a reasonable notice damage award. And we, uh, I don't think we can rely on a 24-month cap anymore, unfortunately. There have been a few decisions uh, that have breached the 24-month the limit, one of which is this Hussein and Suzuki case. Obviously, that's really only going to be uh, a consideration where you've got a long service employee uh, who is probably getting on in years and is going to have some difficulty finding alternate employment. In the Suzuki uh, decision, we had a 65-year-old employee with 36 years service, uh, and the reasonable uh, notice period that was awarded was 26 months. So that particular decision kind of blows two of those rules of thumb out of the water, one of which is the 24-month limit, obviously not the case um, where we had a 26-month reasonable notice period, and then also this question of um, the presumptive retirement age of 65. The employee was 65 and still received um, over two years common law reasonable notice. So these decisions really um, kind of shake the foundation of some of those rules of thumb that we uh, have come to rely upon in some situations. And it, and it just underscores the fact that we um, we really need to think hard about whether these are, uh, are still appropriate rules of thumb. Um, and as the key takeaway, obviously, now that we've discussed what the potential exposure is um, in the re reasonable notice context, the key takeaway is to have a well-drafted employment contract with a valid termination clause, which is our smooth segue. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering where you were going That's with that. That's right. To um, Jeff. And, and just, to, just to reiterate what Carmen was saying, the, the comments that she was making, particularly about short service employees and the 24 month cap, the cases that she cited aren't isolated either. Um, we've seen a number of cases on the short service employee getting a, an inordinately long notice period compared with their length of service and the 24 month notice period. I would say courts are still hesitant to go above it, but there are a number of decisions on it. So it's not, um, these aren't isolated on usual cases, they're becoming much more common as courts look at, you know, what is a realistic notice period. Um, so with that, Carmen is all dark and dreary, I am the white knight. So um, I thought before we got into a discussion about sort of termination clauses in employment contracts, I would, I would talk a little bit about um, the, the perceptions of employment contracts because as we all know, they can be two pages, they can be 20 pages, uh, they can have everything dealt with under the sun, they can key in only on certain provisions. But in, in, at base, the real question is sort of how, how philosophically do you want to address these issues? Because from what I've seen and, and clients that I've spoken to, um, there seem to be different camps in terms of the approach to employment contracts. I mean, obviously some of the primary benefits of them are they minimize disputes. If the contract is clear, you can have um, clarity right at the front end, which helps you throughout the relationship and particularly at the end of the relationship. You can also build in a lot more flexibility. If your contract is clear that you're retaining rights in certain respects or that you uh, reserve the right to make changes, that can really help you avoid constructive dismissal claims um, down the road when you have to make business decisions and business changes. And then third is, and I'll get into this in a little more detail, minimizing the costs on employee exits. And I have one client who said that it's not only minimizing costs on exits, it's minimizing disputes on exits. Um, because what they do, they don't say ESA minimum, they say three weeks per year. And what they say is, that means that instead of calling you every third time we terminate somebody, we call you every 20th time we terminate somebody. So it's, it's the idea of minimizing the cost, but also minimizing the disputes on the exits. Um, I have some clients who frankly don't really use them. They may use an offer letter or you know a two-page little contract. And, 
And what they say is, we've been burned by employment contracts before. We've had cases where we've made mistakes in them, and it's cost us more than if we had nothing. So in terms of their approach, they'd say, OK, leave less to writing, more to flexibility. Um, I've also had some clients say that if you have an unduly restrictive contract, it's hard to get talent. It's hard to get people in the door when you're presenting them with a 20-page contract that locks them up every which way to Tuesday. And then um, some have said, look, they'd be great, but we just don't like the idea of saying, it's great to have your board sign this because when we fire you, we want to only pay you the ESA minimum. So there's all sorts of good arguments on both sides of the, of, of the, of the table as to whether to use them or not. Um, I'm a fan of them. I'm not necessarily a fan of a big 20 to 25 pager, but I'm a, a fan of a, of a two, three, four pager that sets out the basic obligations and rights on both sides. And I thought what I would do is I would, I would review a few of the clauses um, that you should think about if you're having employment contracts and, and review some of, the, some of what I've seen in terms of, of um, common clauses in employment contracts. And, and this goes to the whole, do you want to have a 20 page? Do you want to have a two page? Because obviously the less you have, sort of the shorter you're going to be. But in terms of some of the, the provisions to watch for or think about, um, one of them, and this won't apply to sort of senior executive levels, but for a certain level is what are you doing with hours of work and overtime? Um, and this really came out of the uh, KPMG class action a number of years ago. Um, and questions started being raised in a whole bunch of different forums about people who were salaried, people who everybody had assumed would not be eligible for overtime were suddenly eligible for overtime. It's a great idea to give that some thought at the front end. If you're going to be overtime eligible, what are the terms of that? Um, you've got, in Ontario, you've got a 44-hour overtime threshold. What if you have a 37 and a half hour work week? What are you going to do between 37 and a half and 44 for salaried people? Are you going to pay them anything? Or are you going to say your salary is compensation to all work time worked up to 44 hours? I had a case a couple of years ago of somebody who was salaried, was eligible for overtime, but that's all they said. And it was a 37 and a half hour work week. After the person was terminated, she brought a claim for wrongful dismissal. And she said, and by the way, you told me when I started, I was working 37 and a half hours. And I thought that was my salary for 37 and a half hours. But I worked over 40 hours a week. I may not have needed overtime under the ESA, but you owe me two and a half hours uh, extra for the last two years. And she brought that claim saying that it wasn't so much on the Employment Standards Act, but it was a, a claim based on what we call quantum merit, which is I did extra work beyond what you thought I should do and what you represented I would have to do, and you should have to pay me for that. And you know, two and a half hours a week over two years isn't the end of the world, but it adds up. So that's one, one big question. Um, and then you get into questions about approval for overtime and how you're going to handle that. A lot of times that's left to a policy. Um, but you might want to reference your policy in your employment agreement and say, as amended from time to time. Um, the next one is vacation. And vacation can really lead into issues where you've got somebody on a long-term leave of absence. If you've got somebody on a long-term leave, like a pregnancy leave or a medical leave, for example, they come back after two years. and if the employment contract, all it says is you get three weeks of pay uh, of time off per year of service, questions can be raised. And I've had these questions raised before. OK, well, I may not have been working, but I was still an employee. And now I've got two more years under my belt. I should have two more years of vacation time banked up. And because the employment agreement says with pay, I should get paid for that. Now, the idea of somebody coming back from a one or two year leave and then taking sort of three or four more weeks off with pay raises the question, how do you want to deal with that? Um, then you get into all sorts of questions about bonus and variable comp. And this is a big area of dispute, particularly on employee exit. Um, but even during the employment relationship, how are you going to deal with times when you want to change the variable comp? If you've put in your, your maximum bonus is 50% of your salary plus an extra 20% stretch threshold, what are you going to do if you want to change that? If you're if your criteria for a bonus are spelled out in your employment contract, are they stuck? Are you stuck with that? What happens when you want to make changes to it? Because that's a big area of constructive dismissal. And then, as Carmen said, with longer and longer notice periods, the question becomes, is somebody eligible for a bonus over the notice period? And I can tell you, courts generally say that absent provisions to the contrary, people are eligible for bonuses in the same way as they worked over the notice period as if they had worked. So if you have a two-year severance period, 
then an employee can make a claim, well, not only am I entitled to my salary for that two-year period, I'm entitled to bonuses over that period. And so these are the things you want to think about as you're drafting either your bonus policy or an employment agreement. How are you going to deal with these things uh, on termination? And then we go ahead four or five slides. <laughs> the plan. Um, another big one is benefits. Um, so particularly medical benefits, dental benefits, all of those kinds of things. You want to try and, and build in some, some flexibility to change those plans over time so that you're not getting into issues of, well, you promised me a certain benefit plan and you have to maintain that. But even more importantly, think about benefits continuing over the common law notice period. And the big issue here is uh, disability coverage. And employers in several cases have gotten hammered where uh, em employees are terminated, they bring wrongful dismissal claims, and then at some point over the notice period, they become disabled. And they say, you employer had to continue my disability coverage over the notice period. And that's significant because if you have a 45-year-old employee who's been terminated and has a six-month notice period, and at month, month three, they get critically injured, their disability benefits could arguably last for 20 years until they're 65. And what they can say is, since I became disabled over the notice period, my benefit coverage should have been in place. And the challenge is, disability providers will not provide disability coverage generally over a common law notice period. So employers have this problem on disability coverage in particular, where the insurer says, the terms of our policy will not permit us or will not permit you to extend disability coverage to an employee who's no longer working, except for the ESA termination pay period, which is, as Carmen said, a week, a week per year to a maximum of eight. So if your contract with your employee isn't clear, you may be stuck with the employee saying, you owe me disability coverage over the notice period, and you saying, we can't provide it because our policy doesn't provide it, provide for it and doesn't allow for it, in which case, if the employee does become disabled, you can become a self-insurer. And there are cases out there that say an employer who discontinues disability coverage over a common law notice period, if they don't have a release from the employee, become self-insurers, in which case you have to pay the disability benefits that your insurer would have paid while the employee remains disabled. So that's a huge issue. And by and large, courts do not like the employer saying, well, the employee should have looked at our benefit plan, because typically the employee doesn't have access to the underlying policy. So it's a real issue where you can fall into this gap period. Um, Another one is a signing bonus or a clawback. So often, if you're retaining key talent, you'll say, we'll pay you a big signing bonus up front. And you might put in your contract, if you leave within six months, then you have to repay it. That's great, but you have to go further. And this is a province by province thing. If you want to be able to recover that from wages, it has to say that directly in the contract. Because the employment standards legislation in Ontario says, you can't make a deduction from wages unless the employee agrees to the deduction. So the idea here is, if your signing bonus says you have to repay it, the employee owes you the debt, but you can't recover that from the employee's wages. In other words, if the employee resigns within the six months and should pay you back the, the signing bonus, the employee can say, well, under the Employment Standards Act, you can't withhold any of my last payments, so you owe me my salary to my last day worked and my vacation pay, and then you can sue me for the signing bonus if you want to. So if you want a signing bonus to be deducted from wages, it has to say that and the employee has to sign off on it. That's one thing that cannot be in a policy because the Employment Standards Branch of the Ministry of Labor says that the employee has to specifically agree to it. So if you use signing bonuses or any retention arrangements that you're going to require an employee to pay back, they have to be in writing signed by the employee. Otherwise, all it is is a debt that you have to sue the employee for. Uh, another one is conflict of interest or external employment. Um, this is sometimes not an issue for lower, lower level employees, but certainly senior employees. You don't want them uh, doing anything off on their own without you knowing about it. Um, compliance with policies is another good uh, clause to have in there generally. Um, the termination provision. This is a big one for a lot of employers. Um, the reason you use the termination provision is obviously to rebut this whole ugly common law gross thing that Carmen talks about. <laughs> Um, if you have termination provisions in your employment contract, then they can be enforceable and they can rebut the common law as long as they otherwise comply with the employment standards legislation in the, in the applicable province. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, this is a particular watch for people who are uh, Canadian affiliates of U.S. corporations. 
please, 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 I would be so happy if I never saw the words at will employment ever again. Um, if you are using something that you bring up from the US, just make sure you review it carefully because all of the provinces in Canada have the minimum employment standards legislation. And if you violate the minimum employment standards legislation, our courts have said the termination clause is invalid entirely and, they, and the employee gets common law. So it's not like the court will say, oh, an at-will termination clause, okay, the person gets the minimum ESA. The court says if it violates the ESA, it falls away completely and the employee gets full common law. So dipping below the ESA just leads you to common law. Um, then you get, of course, the restrictive covenants, which is typically just for the more senior folk. Um, and there you just want to make sure that they are reasonably tailored. Um, going overbroad on restrictive covenants will lead to unenforceability. So generally speaking, I say no longer than a year. Um, I have seen some for two years, and particularly if you're in a sale of a business where you're buying or selling a business, you can get into more broad restrictive covenants. But in the employment relationship, our courts generally view them as against public policy and hate them. They hate them. Let's just come out and say it. So our courts will look at them to make sure that they are only for a reasonable, i.e. short length of time, that they only restrict somebody within a reasonable geographic area, and that they only restrict the business that is reasonable. So if you are a large corporation and you are hiring someone into a specific division and you say you'll be prohibited from doing any business that the corporation does, you're going to run into trouble because that person is going to say, all I did was work in the glass division and you have prohibited me from working in the glass division, the jug provision division, and the table division. It has to be tailored to what the person does. Same thing on the geographic restriction. If you have a salesperson who works in a specific territory, don't try to cover all of Canada. Cover only the territory the employee works in. So really take a look at um, what types of work the person is doing and what range the person has in drafting your restrictive covenant. And then lastly, when you're doing a restrictive covenant, always, always, always include both a non-compete and a non-solicit if you're going to include a non-compete. The non-solicit is much more enforceable so if you have a non-compete, you should always have a non-solicit so that you can fall back on it. Okay, even if the non-compete isn't unenforceable, you still have non-solicitation obligations. So make sure they're both in there. On the proprietary rights issue, that's often very employee specific. Some employees have um, much more access to creation of sensitive information. But if you have someone who you're hiring to develop something, generally speaking, the common law will provide you with some protection. So if it's clear that the employee made something for you in the course of their employment, you'll get protection from the common law. But where we see disputes more and more is the employee who claims that they were working off hours. And this goes back to the whole conflict of interest external employment issue. If somebody is making something purely on their own time, not using corporate resources, they may say, well, no, that doesn't belong to you. And a good, strongly worded proprietary rights clause can really hammer that down by saying, if you're working on anything else that in any way bears or might bear on our relationship, you have to tell us other than otherwise we own it. So you can certainly deal with that on the front end in your employment contract. Uh, the next one is confidentiality. Again, the law gives you, the common law gives you some protection on confidentiality. So generally speaking, employees have obligations of confidentiality at common law, but you can strengthen that. You can make it clear to employees what kind of information you consider to be confidential. Because that's the other issue is the employee who claims, well, I didn't know the trade secret was secret. Um, you can deal with that directly in your employment agreement. Um, then you get into things like travel obligations. If you're going to have somebody that you expect to travel, uh, make sure that you tell them they're required to abide by the immigration requirements and maintain uh, appropriate travel documents at all times so that if they ultimately lose their ability to travel, they can't claim, well, it wasn't really a, a fundamental part of my employment. Uh, expense reimbursement, you might want to mention that they have to follow your policies and procedures because that's a big area of employee fraud. That's a whole other presentation that we could do. Um, then we get into obligation to maintain professional uh, designations, and then what you're going to do in the event of a purchase and sale. Um, I have seen in many um, transactional arrangements, issues arise uh, around employees and how you transfer them over. Um, more and more, I'm seeing clauses that say something along the lines of, you agree that in the event of a sale of a business, your employment and this agreement may be transferred to a purchaser of the business. 
that allows you to say to the employee, okay, we're selling the business, the purchaser is going to assume your employment contract and good luck with everything. The reason that's important is on an asset transaction, there is no uh, implied obligation on an employee to go to a purchaser. And so particularly when you get into sale transactions of long, where there are long service employees, a long service employee, and it doesn't happen often, but a long service employee may say, hey, if I don't want to go, let's say I want to retire, what can I do going out the door? And as Carmen said, you know, there's the employment standard severance obligation that can be a week per year up to 26 weeks. For a long service employee who's thinking of retiring, that may be a good time to leave. So a, an assignment clause that says that you, the employer can assign to a purchaser may not be a bad idea. Um, another one, and I, I, I've, I've had discussions with Chantal Bernier about this, is um, what do you do, and this is becoming increasingly an issue around disclosure of contracts to purchasers of a business. This can arise where you're involved in a transaction and you're sitting out there saying, we can't let employees know that the transaction's going because it's not public yet, but the purchaser is asking us for disclosure of the contracts. And you get into real privacy issues, particularly depending on the province, around disclosure of employee information. It's becoming a lot more uh, common now to disclose information without employee names and anonymizing it all. Um, arguably, a disclosure clause like that to say, if we're involved in a transaction and we and the purchaser agrees to maintain confidentiality, you agree that we can disclose your contract to a potential purchaser, can, is, is a way to think about getting around that. Um, and then lastly, and this is the shout out to those who use restrictive covenants, make sure you have a severability clause. And basically what that means is, to the extent anything is unenforceable, it can be severed and the remainder of the agreement remains in full force and effect. This is where you have the non-compete and the non-solicit clause and you say, okay, even if the non-compete is at the end of the day unenforceable, we can still rely on the non-solicit clause. A severability helps that argument so that you can say, look, the contract specifically contemplated what would happen if uh, one of the clauses was invalid, that the rest of it would survive and, and go merrily on its way. Um, this is one that's come up a little bit more, and I'll be frank with you, I haven't seen it in um, a lot of contracts, but just so that you're aware, the common law right now does not typically allow an employer to suspend someone from employment for a disciplinary reason. What a few courts have now said is that that constitutes a constructive dismissal unless the right to do it is in the contract. So if you use um, a disciplinary suspension from employment uh, commonly in your workplace, you should look at either getting it into your contract or getting it into a policy. Um, this generally does not apply in the unionized environment. Yay, unionized employers. <laughs> Um, suspensions are alive and well for unionized employers, but for non-union employers, suspensions can be problematic. Now, I had one client I was talking to about this who said, I want to suspend somebody for two days without pay because he's, I won't use the acronym, um, but they said, I want to suspend him for two days without pay. And I said, well, there's a risk of constructive dismissal because you don't have a policy on suspensions and it's not in your employment agreement. And this employer said, well, I don't really care. I don't really like him, and if he wants to claim constructive, I'll just live with that. And there's nothing wrong with that. You just need to be aware of the risk, that's all. So that's one, one question about disciplinary suspensions. Uh, the other one is about layoffs, and this is one that we have seen, um, you know, as the economy ebbs and flows, um, a lot of people have gotten away uh, from calling it layoffs, and, and they call it all sorts of wonderful other things, but basically telling an employee, look, we've got a reduction in work, uh, so we're going to um, lay you off for a period of weeks or a couple of months. The Employment Standards Act allows you to do it. So the Employment Standards Act says a layoff does not uh, become a termination except um, within if it lasts certain lengths of time. But that doesn't mean that common law lets you do it. And this is a really important thing to keep in mind. Again, yay, unionized employers, they are allowed to lay off. Um, but in the non-union world, if you don't have a policy or something in an employment agreement saying that you're allowed to lay off and you haven't historically done it, layoffs, generally speaking, are one of those areas where it con can constitute constructive dismissal. So think about a policy, think about your employment agreement, something of that nature, because uh, if you need to use layoffs in your business and you're non-union, then uh, you could face a slew of constructive dismissal claims if you try and lay off employees, even if the layoff is not a termination under the Employment Standards Act. So. Um, I thought that was my last slide, but it's not. So the other, one of the other um, important areas that uh, you want to think about in an employment agreement, 
is what, what I call anti-obsolescence or novation language. Um, where you enter into an employment contract with an employee, and let's uh, termination clauses are, are a, a good example of this. Day one, you enter into, a ter into an employment agreement with Carmen, who is at the time um, the janitor. Carmen is a great janitor. You enter into a contract with her. She's paid $13 an hour as a janitor. And the termination clause says, all you get if you're terminated is the Employment Standards Act minimums. So Carmen signs that. Carmen's all happy. Carmen is very motivated in over 15 years. Carmen rises from the janitor level to the CEO. You then go to terminate Carmen and you say, Carmen, your employment's being terminated. We have a great ESA clause. You're terminated. You're now earning $100,000. So 15 weeks at uh, $100,000 plus your eight weeks of termination pay, 23 weeks uh, of your base salary and eight weeks of benefit continuance. Have a great day. And what is Carmen going to say about that? She's going to say, I signed that when I was the janitor. I'm now the CEO. That contract was no longer valid because there have been fundamental changes in my employment. An, a novation clause or an anti-obsolescence clause basically says the terms of this agreement continue to apply notwithstanding any other changes unless a specific written agreement is entered into between you and us to change those provisions. That can be really helpful, particularly on a termination clause, so that you know, even if it's not as dramatic as janitor to CEO, if somebody starts out in a sales rep role and then becomes a manager or an EVP or something like that, you can rely on it. That also raises the question of what do you give an employee who changes levels or changes roles. I think it's a great idea to give them a one pager that says, congratulations on your promotion. You know, here's your new salary. Here's your new benefits area. Other than this, the terms of your current employment agreement continue to apply, something like that. That would work effectively uh, in the same way as this kind of novation language uh, in an employment contract. So, Geez, I just keep coming more with them. Um, the, the entire agreement clause. So this is another important clause in an employment agreement because basically um, I've seen in a few occasions you hire somebody who seems like a great fit and they are a disaster. And you fire them within three months, six months, nine months, and lo and behold, you have a termination clause that you rely on. And the person says, yeah, 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 but hang on. When I signed that agreement, you represented to me that this was going to be a great, fantastic job, and I was going to get all sorts of support and men mentorship, and none of that happened. And what they essentially say is, if the representations you had made to me had been true, I would have been great in this job. So the termination clause should not apply. An entire agreement clause can get around that by saying, essentially, other than what's in this agreement, we haven't made any promises to you to get away from the whole things I was told during the recruitment phase. There we go. Those are kind of the, the, the highlights of the employment contract provisions I wanted to talk about. And now I tried to come up with a, a top 10 list, and I'm obviously not as creative as I used to be. I got to six. So I wanted to review um, some of the, what I think are the top six areas where employers make mistakes on employment contracts, and that have, as I said, led some of my clients to say, look, great idea, but I've been burned and I don't want to do it again. Um, one of them is consideration. And this is the old law school hand me a dollar as you're giving me something of value, because if you don't give me something of value, I'm not bound by the contract. In the employment world, it is alive and well, and our courts love it. So the idea being, if you hire an employee and have them sign an employment contract, that contract is only valid if they get something of value when they sign it. The something of value that they typically get when they sign the employment agreement is employment. I will hire you if, I sign, if you sign this. Person signs it, away they go. The value is the employment itself. Problems that employers get into is the whole first day of employment sign-ups. Welcome aboard. We're great to have you here. It's 9.30 in the morning. You've just finished you know, your orientation and grabbed a cup of coffee, signed this employment agreement. In those situations, our courts have said there's no consideration because the person had already started working, the employer had already agreed to the employment, and the employee had already accepted that employment. So the, the contract and the promise of employment can't constitute consideration because the employment relationship was already formed. So what you need to do is you need to give the employment contract to the person when they are offered employment, and it needs to be, con uh, needs to be made clear to them that their hiring is contingent on them signing it. Um, if you don't do that and you're running into trouble and you need to um, and you need to have someone sign an employment agreement, don't worry. The consideration law loves you if you give them a bonus. And our courts have said it right now. It doesn't have to be a huge amount. Literally, it can be something relatively nominal. So if you 
don't have, um, if you don't have them sign it at the outset and you want to have them sign it, give them a bonus. You know, $500, $1,000, anything will do. But it has to be an off-cycle payment. If somebody always receives a regular bonus, don't make the regular bonus part of the consideration because what they'll argue later is that was my normal bonus. It needs to be off-cycle. It can be a promise of a, pro of a promotion. If somebody's being promoted from sales rep to EVP, you can say to them, you can take the EVP role, but we require all our EVPs to sign this contract and the promotion is conditional on you signing it. Anything of consideration, anything of value can be consideration as long as it, the employee wouldn't otherwise receive it. And that's why our courts have always said continued employment is typically not consideration because the employee already has it. Anything you want to add on that? No. Okay, we're good. Uh, second um, top, top six list is fixed term contracts. I generally say stay away from them. There are so many pitfalls with fixed term contracts that unless it's a real, there's a real reason for a fixed term contract, I typically say stay away from them. There are lots of pitfalls. I've, I've mentioned a few here, um, which is if the fixed term exceeds 12 months, the ESA entitlements kick in. So for example, if you have an employee who has five years of service and you put them on a fixed term one year contract at the end, sort of saying, okay, we're going to finish off, you'll still owe them severance in Ontario. Um, if you have an employee who's on an 18 month contract, you still have to make sure that you provide them with one week's advance written notice of termination or you'll owe them uh, termination pay in lieu. There are creative arguments and counsel are very creative on this stuff of saying if you give an employee an 18 month term contract and say that you have no obligations to them, that contract is void because it contravenes the ESA so you owe them common law after 18 months. There are all sorts of creative, comments, uh, creative arguments around fixed term contracts. Another is what I've seen, and the law supports this, if you don't have an early termination provision in your fixed term contract and you want to terminate it early, you have to pay out to the end of the term. I had a client who hired someone for a one-year mat leave, so they said, you're hired for one year. The employee who was on mat leave said, I want to come back early, which is her right under the ESA, and so three months in, I don't know what happened with the baby, maybe she didn't like being home, maybe she didn't like her baby, but whatever, um, she came back after three months, the employer then moved to terminate the fixed term contract employee and ultimately faced a demand letter for the remaining nine months of the contract. And the argument was, you hired me for 12 months, you didn't hire me for three months. So be very careful on that. If you have a fixed term contract, get an early out clause. Uh, the next is, is 15 years old, which is if you keep using people on the same fixed term contracts, that person becomes an indefinite term contract. I always get questions, how many is too many? If we have an employee on a fixed term contract and then we use one more fixed term contract, is that indefinite term? Probably not. You can likely get away with two or three. When you get into six or seven or eight, you are probably dead. If you have used the same person on 10 fixed term contracts, that person is very likely an indefinite term contract, uh, an indefinite uh, term employee and you will owe them common law notice at the end uh, of the term if you don't, if you don't keep, keep them on. Um, then the other problem, which is you've hired somebody for 12 months, but you actually need them for a couple of more months or you keep them on indefinite. If somebody works even one day beyond their fixed term, they become an indefinite term contract employee. And generally speaking, any early out clause stops applying. So if you've got a, a clause that says, we're hiring you for 12 months, that person, and within the 12 months, we can terminate you on ESA, and that person works for 12 months in a day, guess what? Generally speaking, the termination clause won't apply and you'll owe them common law. So that's exciting. Number three, and this is another big one, which is problematic termination clauses. Um, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you uh, draft a termination clause that is not clear or contravenes the ESA. Um, termination clauses can be great. I am a big fan of them. Um, you just have to be really careful with how they're drafted. First off, as we've said, they have to comply or exceed the ESA in order to be valid. That means that they have to be provided with um, at least ESA notice or, uh, and severance in Ontario. And in Ontario, it means benefit continuance. And I can't tell you how many contracts I've seen that say great things about, we can provide you with notice and severance as required by the ESA or pay in lieu thereof. Problem is, pay in lieu thereof does not incorporate benefits. So if you've got a termination clause that references the ESA, 
in Ontario, it needs to reference benefits. And this is another big problem with transporting clauses from other contra from uh, clauses from other provinces. In BC, for example, you don't need to continue benefits for the ESA period. In, uh, in BC, apparently, you can cut them off the day the termination arises. But in Ontario, your clause is subject to challenge if you don't meet that benefits clause under the ESA. Um, another one is uh, the mitigation issue. And I talked earlier about my client with the three, three weeks per year of service. If you have a clause that is more generous than the ESA, so for example, you know, senior executive, you say, we'll give you 12 months of notice or pay with benefits in lieu of notice. First of all, you'd want to have the carve out for the disability coverage. So shout out for the disability coverage because often your insurer won't continue it. Um, so you'd continue that for only the ESA period in Ontario. But leaving that aside, there's a, a case from a couple of years ago. I can't believe it's 2012 already. <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, Bowes and Goss Power, where our Ontario Court of Appeal has made very clear that if a contract provides an employee with a termination entitlement, there is no mitigation reduction for that um, unless the contract provides otherwise. So if you have a clause that says on termination you get 12 months of notice or pay in lieu of notice with benefit continuance without disability coverage, other than as required by the ESA, um, that person can get that 12 months even if two weeks later they get another job. So if you want to have mitigation language in your contract, it has to be explicit. If you include mitigation language in your contract, you also have to be careful that your contract still complies with the ESA. Because saying less any mitigation could then violate the ESA because if the employee gets a job two weeks later with exactly the same compensation but is owed four weeks of termination pay, the, e the mitigation clause may be struck down because, of course, the employee has mitigated. Um, and if your mitigation clause doesn't comply with the ESA, you sort of leave the court with, what do you do? Does the court strike down the whole clause? Does the strike court strike down only the mitigation clause? you can run into all sorts of, of, of problems there. So if you're including a mitigation clause, make sure it says, but in no case will you get less than your ESA entitlements. And I love the word entitlements. Minimum ESA entitlements is a great word because it incorporates pay and benefits. So instead of saying pay, think of entitlements because the ESA is more than just pay. So that's number three. Um, number four is the probationary period. If it weren't for the people on the webinar, I would bang my head against the microphone <laughs> for the number of times I have faced clients who's, who are under the impression that there is a presumption of, of probation in, in uh, Ontario and in Canada. There is no presumption of probationary employment um, in Canada unless a contract provides for it. The fact that the employment standards legislation doesn't require notice of termination in the first three months of employment in Ontario does not mean that the employee is probationary. If you hire somebody, they are a full ranking employee with all the normal rights other than what's provided in the employment contract. So if you want probation, you have to provide for it. If you want probation, it doesn't have to be three months. It can be longer than three months. Three months is the ESA period, so it's common that people will do three months. You can do longer than three months. But if you're going to do longer than three months, you have to make sure that your probationary period complies back with the ESA. So if you have a probationary period of six months, you have to make sure that the clause says, without notice, except as required by the ESA. Because after three months, you'll be into the ESA of one week. Um, the, uh, and, and to Carmen's point, one of the things that always um, shouts out is, if you don't have probationary language and you terminate, Somebody, and, and you don't have a termination provision, somebody who gets terminated after two or three months can get an inordinately long notice period. So it's important to deal with that on right on. Uh, restrictive covenants, I already talked about this a little bit because I love restrictive covenants. Um, they are commonly struck down by our courts. Um, courts hate employers trying to uh, enforce them. What I say to clients is don't make them standard. Look at them where it's warranted for the employee. If you're hiring an employee into a senior role, look at what that clause should say for that person. Don't look at kind of what you've used historically because what you use for an EVP is not going to be the same as what you use for a sales rep. Look very carefully at the nature of their role and what would be reasonable. I um, already talked about most of this, so I'm, I'm going to sort of skip over this clause. Uh, other than to say a severability clause here is key, again, on the non-solicit, non-compete side. Um, my last point, and then I will leave you for a little while, um, is the references to benefits and workplace policies. Um, this is where, particularly on bonuses, you want to be careful. Um, 
if your bonus language does not incorporate flexibility, you can be stuck with a certain bonus provision because if you put a bon if you put bonus language in your contract, it's just that it's a contract. And if you want to change the bonus in future, whether it be the entitlement or how you calculate it, when the employee is entitled to it, the max and the min, the stretch, all of that stuff. Once you put it in the contract, it is a contractual entitlement. And the way our courts are going right now, it's it can only be changed if the employee agrees. So build in flexibility. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and I talked about this a little bit uh, earlier, is benefits and plans and policies. It's a very good idea to put in your employment contracts, if you're referencing benefits, that all benefits are subject to underlying policies or plans, and that to the extent they're insured, the decision of the insurer is final. That takes you out of the equation and puts the employee over to their insurer. Um, that sort of helps with the self-insuring problems. Um, and combined with a termination clause that says benefits will only be continued for the ESA notice period uh, can help you avoid that whole self-insurer side. So with that, I will turn it back over to Carmen for the uh, just cause side. Thanks, Thank you. Jeff. So we've now at this stage seen the, the minefield <laughs> of risks that, uh, that face employers at common law, and Jeff has now uh, just basically giving you all the secret to a premium employment contract that will mitigate all of those risks. And so we're going to turn our attention now to um, sort of the second half of, of this particular seminar, um, and that is our Just Cause update. And Just Cause, of course, is the thorn in every employer's side. I don't know how often we, we have conversations with clients that involve a recitation of a litany of performance issues that a given employee has. And, and often the conversation concludes with, I still can't fire this person for just cause. So it's, it's a thorny issue and it's one that uh, we can move through sort of the basics pretty quickly. And then we'll focus in on uh, a particular subset of just cause um, issues that kind of revolve around the off-duty conduct issue. So as our update, the general rule with respect to just cause is that an employment contract can only be lawfully terminated by an employer if the employer gives the employee reasonable notice of termination or pay in lieu. So this is what we've just spent the first half of, uh, of this seminar discussing. So the exception is where there is just cause for dismissal. And in that circumstance, the employer can terminate the employment relationship immediately without notice and without pay in lieu of notice. Now, uh, we all understand and appreciate that this is uh, the case, I'm sure, but it bears repeating um, that just cause dismissals need to be approached uh, with very careful consideration uh, before acting on it. The courts have, have sort of referred to just cause dismissal as the employment world's capital punishment, um, which is a pretty clear message to, to all employers that um, you don't want to enact capital punishment without um, lots of consideration beforehand. There are only going to be uh, very specific scenarios in which uh, a just cause dismissal can be upheld. Now, the employer, of course, bears the onus of proving just cause, and whether just cause exists is a question of fact. Um, and we all know that this is a, a very high legal threshold in Ontario. Uh, like I said, uh, you've got a high bar to meet if you are attempting to establish that um, as an employer you had just cause to terminate an employee. The courts continue to adopt a contextual approach here uh, over an absolute rule that certain um, specific categories of conduct like theft or assault um, will always constitute just cause. This is, uh, this is not going to be the case. It's much more nuanced and uh, sort of contextual discussion. And it's going to look at such things as whether the employee has engaged in misconduct to a degree that is incompatible with uh, continued employment. And there's also a question of proportionality. Uh, the courts are going to be looking for a degree of proportionality as between the severity of the uh, impugned conduct and, and then also uh, looking at whether 
the just cause dismissal was a proportionate response to, to that uh, misbehavior. Uh, it's important to note that proving just cause under the common law may differ from proving it under the statute. And the key question really that uh, needs to be considered in determining whether you have a just cause situation on your hands is whether the employee's behavior constitutes willful misconduct, willful misconduct, so um, that's already a fairly high bar uh, to meet, disobedience or willful, again, neglect of duty. So um, this particular terminology sort of underscores the fact that, for example, performance problems um, often will not provide you with a sound basis for a just cause dismissal, which is incredibly frustrating to employers. Um, but again, it, where we're looking at um, considerations of willful misconduct or willful neglect of duty, uh, that's a high standard and, and a simple sort of um, inefficiency or an inability to perform the employee's job very well likely uh, will not meet that particular threshold. Yeah, and that, just to, just to chime in on that point, the, the other issue is if somebody has been around for seven, eight, nine years and you're now saying we have performance just cause, one of the big questions is going to be if they are so crummy. <laughs> How did they last for eight, nine, ten years? And and so particularly when you get into performance uh, related cause issues, unless there is kind of a red flag, some huge incident that's happened, it's tremendously difficult because the person I've had lawyers on the other sides of the file say, "Oh sure, yeah, he was crummy. We accept that, but he wasn't that crummy." And that's the that's the problem that you face because our courts think just cause is such a high standard that somebody who is substandard isn't sort of that bad that they deserve just cause. Because mm -hmm. all our courts are saying is they deserve a severance package. And that can be really hard, particularly with somebody who's lasted uh, for several years, unless there's some real issue that's gone on. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Thanks. Um, and so in that respect, I, I think that it is useful to keep in mind this terminology that the courts have used um, as likening just cause dismissal to capital punishment. So really that is the, you know, the most severe um, sanction that you can impose on an employee. So the conduct uh, for which you're terminating the employee has to be equally severe. It's that question of proportionality. So that that's probably the easiest maxim to bear in mind when you're dealing with these situations. So the just cause landscape is a pretty broad landscape, um, and we wanted to narrow in on sort of a discrete subset. And so we've, we've chosen off-duty conduct as um, a particularly timely issue. It's becoming increasingly relevant for employers. Um, and so for the next series of slides, we're going to look at off-duty conduct, but particularly in sort of the wired world context, um, this idea that, that employees now have a public platform uh, via social media, and, and so the, the wired nature of our existence opens up a whole new um, menu of potential off-duty conduct issues. So we're going to just look at why off-duty conduct matters to an employer, um, when it actually matters. We'll quickly cover the legal standard that's been established, and then we're going to move into some best practice tips and considerations. So as I was just alluding to, our, world, our wired world um, has had the effect of blurring lines between personal and professional lives. We are all, I think, um, fairly aware of that fact. And there are fewer circumstances in which off-duty conduct is not discovered or publicized. We have, you know, teams of millennials out there <laughs> wielding iPhones <laughs> who can, uh, you know, snap a picture at any given moment, who can start a video recording. So our conduct is, um, is often captured <laughs> whether we know it or not. Uh, and then we've got the unique developments that, uh, that come alongside uh, the burgeoning world of social media. So you've got employees who are posting on Facebook, empo employees who are posting on Instagram, who are twi tweeting. And like I said, it, this essentially means that all employees have a public platform um, or a, in some cases a soapbox <laughs> from which to you know, air their views on the world. Um, we're also seeing, and this is again through the, the, the rise of social media, 
this idea where um, we have internet vigilantes, essentially, who uh, wherever they've observed conduct that is somehow reprehensible, there are now means by which to figure out who committed that conduct and essentially um, publicly shame or out the the uh, the person who whose conduct was so reprehensible. So we're now seeing situations um, where what would otherwise be sort of private off-duty conduct um, is becoming publicized through social media. And of course, when are we ever completely off the clock? Um, we're linked with our fellow employees through social media. We talk about uh, our work on social media. And so all this to say that really there is no longer a clear delineation between our personal lives and our professional lives. And that's really the, the sort of background context that gives uh, rise to these issues. There are a couple of recent uh, highly publicized <laughs> incidents that have brought the issue of off-duty conduct sort of to the fore for employers and lawyers um, and HR professionals. And of course, the one that comes to mind is the Hydro One situation that cropped up uh, this past summer where you had a Hydro One employee uh, attending a soccer match and involved in an incident in which a female reporter uh, essentially had uh, abuse shouted at her, <laughs> offensive uh, language was shouted at her. So that situation was highly publicized and we all saw how Hydro One reacted uh, and it was obviously you know, spattered across front pages, uh, I think across the country. Uh, and now, actually, in a very timely development, we've seen sort of the second half of that story um, in which Hydro One was uh, ordered to reinstate the employee in question back in, uh, I think it was July when this happened, uh, June or July, they had ultimately made the decision to terminate the employee. Uh, again, it was uh, sort of a, an issue of, of publicity and optics. And few months down the road and the, that employee is going to be returning to work. So that's something that we'll, we'll keep in mind. But this interesting um, area is, is particularly compelling, I think, for, for lawyers, but also for HR professionals, because we see a, a direct intersection and in some cases a collision between legal standards and practical business considerations um, that revolve around reputation, image, um, and your, I guess, public optics, really. So it's understandable, I think, to all of us that uh, businesses and organizations are concerned with potential damage to their brand uh, and to the services and the products that they present to the public where they have an employee who's engaging in some very public uh, off-duty conduct. So this brings us uh, to the question that we're tackling here, which is uh, what should an employer do? And there's a, a sort of an inherent tension between what an, an employer should do, where they have an employee who is engaged in some sort of reprehensible off-duty conduct, and what can, what legally can the employer do? So to what extent can or should discipline um, up to and including termination, be imposed where off-duty conduct comes to the employer's attention. So as a starting point, we'll take a quick look at the governing legal test. Um, and so the, the analysis here is, is this. If discipline is going to be sustained in response to off-duty conduct, the onus is on the employer to show these five factors. So first, that the conduct of the employee harms the company's reputation or product. Second, that the employee's behavior renders him or her unable to perform uh, his or her duties in a satisfactory manner. Third, the employee's behavior leads to a refusal or a reluctance um, or inability of the coworkers to continue working with the employee in question. Fourth, the employee has been guilty of a serious breach of the criminal code, which renders uh, the conduct in question injurious to the reputation of the company. And fifth, the employee's conduct places difficulty in the way of the company properly carrying out its functions of efficiently managing its works and directing its workforce. So this is the legal framework within which we're operating when we're looking at imposing 
um, discipline in response to off-duty conduct. So what I think becomes immediately apparent when you consider those five factors is that this is, again, a high standard. Not surprising, um, much like the just cause standard is, is a high threshold to meet. Um, some of those five factors really underscore the fact that um, the, the onus that the employer bears is a, is a heavy one. So there are a few key takeaways about this five element uh, analysis that we've just looked at. The first is that it's not necessary for the employer to show that all five of those criteria exist, which is a hu huge relief because one of the five was <laughs> that the employee must have uh, committed a serious breach of the criminal code. Um, that is not a, a, a necessary element to, uh, to prove in order to impose discipline uh, in relation to off-duty conduct. That is one of the five criteria that you will consider. So this is not a checklist. You've got to satisfy one through five. Um, it is a more nuanced and, again, contextual approach. But you're ultimately going to look at the degree of impact of any one of those five criteria. So where you have an employee engaging in conduct that does substantial harm to the employer's reputation, that element alone, and we'll see some illustrations in a moment, that element alone may be sufficient to uphold the discipline. So we've, we know that there's a, a basket sort of a five considerations. But what is absolutely necessary, and this is the key takeaway uh, throughout this conversation, is that there be a real and material connection between the impugned off-duty conduct and the workplace. There needs to be a nexus between what the employee has done, which is so um, reprehensible, and, and some sort of linkage uh, to the workplace and to the employee's uh, employment. So in order to sort of bring the otherwise um, dusty 1967 <laughs> legal test to life, we're going to look at two, um, I told you we'd get to the salacious part, so this is it, um, two illustrations, fairly recent, both of them, uh, of the application of the legal test. So the first is the City of Toronto and Toronto Professional Firefighters Association decision, uh, 2014 decision. And the, the brief factual background is, is this. We had a firefighter, a professional firefighter with two and a half years service who was a prolific tweeter, <laughs> very active in the Twitter world. Um, unfortunately, typically was tweeting sexist, racist, and misogynistic messages, um, highly, uh, deeply offensive on many levels. Now... These tweets came to the employer's attention in a particularly spectacular way. Um, the National Post was actually writing an article and, and was uh, doing some investigative journalism about the Toronto uh, Firefighting Service's recruitment efforts and specifically its efforts to recruit female firefighters. And the National Post article essentially said, okay, so they're undertaking real efforts to bring more females into the service, but ultimately I think those efforts are probably undermined by tweets from firefighters like these. Um, and so it was a, a printed and very high profile um, jur uh, journalistic, I guess, effort that got the employer's attention and, and brought some awareness to the employer about these really deeply offensive tweets. Um, now, the employee claimed that he didn't know that his tweets were public, which didn't hold a lot of water because he, he was clearly, like, very well versed in social media. I believed um, it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he, so he tried to claim, essentially, that he thought he was only tweeting his followers and that only certain people would be able to view these outrageous comments he was making. Obviously not the case. Twitter, it, it blows my mind that people um, don't know how to use social media yet. Um, but he was basically blasting these comments out to the world at large. Um, and ultimately, the, the, the uh, adjudicator in this decision went through the five-element uh, test that we just discussed. But the, the seminal question that she emphasized was, was this, would a reasonable and fair-minded public apprised of all the facts, consider that continued employment would so damage the reputation uh, of the employer so as to render continued employment totally untenable. 
And that's ultimately the, uh, the question that you need to ask. The decision in this case was uh, that the termination, obviously this employee was terminated, the termination was upheld. Um, it was quite clear that the employee had knowingly breached several of the, uh, the firefighting services internal workplace policies. But one of the more significant factors, and, and this brings us back to that, that note that I just uh, made about a nexus between the conduct and the workplace. So one of the most significant factors was the fact that in his Twitter profile picture, this guy was, you know, dressed to the nines in his full firefighting regalia. So there was a, a clear and direct linkage that he himself had made between his tweets and the uh, firefighting service as the employer. So that's the first illustration. The second is a Toronto District School Board decision, um, very recent, 2015. And the fact scenario behind it uh, was an interesting one. We had an employee of the TDSB um, picking up her daughter from school. And when she arrived at school, she perceived her daughter to, to have been bullied. Um, she later said she thought that an older student was attempting to coerce her daughter into buying drugs. The, the employee and the mother in this case um, overreacted to a degree and essentially uh, assaulted this 14-year-old uh, student, screamed abuse at him, um, threatened him, lots of profa profanity, um, insults directed at his mother, um, <laughs> threats like, I work for the TDSB and I can find out anything about you. That's literally one of the threats that she made. And of course, like I said, millennials everywhere, and somebody whips out an iPhone and videotapes the whole thing uh, and posts it to YouTube. Very public, obviously. So in this case, again, the employee was uh, discharged and grieved, and we had an adjudicator deciding whether the dismissal was uh, appropriate or not. And <laughs> In this case, again, when we look at that linkage between the conduct and the uh, and the the workplace, you couldn't be more clear. You've got um, an assault of a TDSB student on TDSB property by an employee of the TDSB who is proclaiming <laughs> that she is, in fact, an employee of the TDSB. So um, clear linkage, um, and ultimately the adjudicator decided that the, uh, the termination was warranted. Again, there was a clear breach of uh, key internal policies um, that had been signed off on by the TDSB employee. So two very real um, applications of the five-part test, which was central. Yeah. Yeah, no, and the so just sorry, just to repeat the question for those on the webinar, mm. um, the question was whether the employer's policies would apply to employee in personal in their personal behavior and personal life. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good question because in the uh, in the TDSB case, the policies didn't specifically make reference to off duty conduct. These were internal policies about um, what we expect generally of our employees. Um, and also in the, the firefighter case, the first, they were relying upon policies that spoke to respect in the workplace, non-discrimination, um, those types of things. And in both cases, the policies, despite the fact that they didn't necessarily um, expressly reference off-duty conduct, made it clear that certain uh, standards of conduct applied. And in both cases, there were clear breaches of those standards. So good question. The policies were, were central in both of these decisions and were uh, relied on pretty heavily by the arbitrators. So those are our two uh, illustrations, like I said, of this particular test. Um, and, and there are, again, a few key takeaways. And this is really where we get into some practical considerations. We've got to keep in mind the standard um, of the objective person. So I made reference to the, the question that the arbitrator asks of him or herself, and that is, would a reasonable and fair-minded public, i.e. the objective person, uh, apprised of all the facts, consider that this conduct um, basically made the employment relationship totally untenable? Um, 
So how evident is the connection to the employer? That is a key question. You've got to be able to establish that there's a nexus. Is it explicit? In those two cases that we just um, reviewed, it was explicit. <laughs> You've got a firefighter wearing his uniform in his Twitter profile picture, tweeting all sorts of highly offensive messaging. Uh, in the second case, you have a TDSB employee screaming about the fact that she is a TDSB employee as she hurls insults um, at a 14-year-old TDSB student. So those are clear examples of an explicit connection. Um, we also mentioned the Hydro One uh, scenario where you've got an employee on his own time attending a soccer match no evident connection, wasn't attending on behalf of Hydro One, wasn't wearing his uniform. Um, that, that, that was a situation where there was not an explicit connection. And the only reason that Hydro One ultimately found out about this was uh, through you know, the efforts of internet vigilantes and just by virtue of the public nature of the conduct. And I think the fact that there wasn't that clear nexus likely had um, something to do with the arbitrator's recent decision to have that employee reinstated. So that just tells us um, how crucial that connection is. Also, the other takeaway here is the centrality of internal policies. Um, is the behavior in question conduct, uh, or the conduct in question targeted by an internal policy? Um, if you can hang your hat on a breach of a policy, then you're much better placed to uh, proceed with some, some discipline. And then there's also the practical question of uh, whether this is a situation in which the legal considerations take a back seat and, and there are just predominant and very um, real concerns about damage to reputation. Um, if, if you've got a situation in which an employee has done something particularly offensive in a particularly public ma manner, then it may be that um, whether you think you can justify the termination or not at the end of the road, you take that action anyhow as a means of distancing um, the employer from that type of conduct and making it clear that the employer doesn't condone uh, whatever conduct was at issue. So that's a, a practical consideration that, that may win the day. And then arising out of our um, cases that we've looked at and the test itself, there are a couple of key questions that need to be borne in mind uh, when you've got a situation where an employee has done something off duty and you're trying to determine uh, to what extent you can slash should impose discipline. The first is, do I have all the facts? You want to make sure that you are, are making your decision uh, with you know the full breadth of, of um, information available to you. You don't want to be uh, finding yourself in a situation where you assumed uh, some particular fact and uh, it turns out that without that fact, the entire decision comes crumbling down. Second, did the employee make the connection between himself or herself uh, and the employer explicit? Like I said, that's going to be a key consideration. Um, repugnance aside, what is the real effect of the conduct on the employer? That's always a consideration. It's, it's one of the five factors uh, set out in the governing test. And in the two decisions we looked at, that was a key consideration. Was there real harm to the reputation uh, of the employer? Finally, uh, is there an internal policy upon which I can rely? That's a key consideration as well. And what is required in order to preserve the company's reputation? And that's where you get into this more, um, we'll say, a little bit more blurry um, analysis of what can I do versus what should I do and, and what's going to win out at the end of the day. My, my legal considerations are my practical considerations. Sometimes they flow together. Sometimes they don't, and that's going to be a, a very real business consideration. So that's our, our overview of key uh, considerations in the off-duty conduct context. But Jeff also has a few tips on managing terminations as a way of sort of closing out our, uh, our presentation. So we, we thought we'd leave you with a, a few thoughts, um, just in terms of when you're facing a termination, um, how best to handle it. And, and the first one that I say that um, you have to really look at is, does the, empl does the employee have a, a, an employment agreement with the termination clause? And often I get the answer, we don't use them. But if you're looking at terminating someone who's got five or 10 years of service, you never know what some crafty HR person did five or 10 years ago. So 
always take a look back through the file before you terminate to see what might be there. Uh, sometimes you might be surprised, particularly if you've had an acquisition and this person is, was part of an acquisition. You may actually have a termination clause in an employment agreement tucked away somewhere for the individual you can rely on. Um, obviously, you have to ask yourself the question about just cause and how you're going to handle that. Um, leaving that aside, is there anything else different about this termination? Um, has this person filed a human rights application or a human rights complaint or are they in an accommodated role? If somebody has recently returned from disability leave or pregnancy leave, you have to do a little more homework. Even on a termination without cause, there are obviously reasons why you cannot terminate somebody. So. Asking the questions, you know, what, what's this person been like recently, you know, anything I should be aware of, disability leave, pregnancy leave, all that kind of stuff, it's essential that you know that because I've had clients before who, particularly internal counsel, the only time you become aware of something is when you get the demand letter and you don't want to be on that, on that side of a demand letter where you're sort of doing the investigation after the termination's happened. Um, then there's the question which is uh, potential for workplace violence. Um, that's obviously um, going to arise in very rare circumstances, but if you are at all concerned about workplace violence, I always say that sort of trumps everything else. Um, your regular security may not be enough. If you really think somebody's volatile, what you probably want to do is make two phone calls. First to your EAP and say, do you guys have a service you recommend because we are terminating someone that we're concerned about? And second is potentially to an outside security firm. Um, I have a client who did uh, a, a termination of somebody they were afraid would be volatile and they brought in a security firm that monitored the workplace for uh, a week afterwards and they had extra security on just in case. Um, I always think on that side of things, uh, the best thing to do if you think somebody is potentially violent is frankly not to cheap on them. Um, has nothing to do with the law, but what you want to do is you want to make that person go away as quickly as you can. And so on that side of things, again, it's not a legal consideration, but if you're involved in severance negotiations with somebody who you're afraid is violent, I would not hesitate to sort of go a little bit extra to make them sign off and get them focused on someone other than you. Um, so uh, a few other things. Um, First off, make sure that there are two people in the termination meeting. Um, next is have a termination script and, and stick to it. And I say this for a couple of reasons. First of all, our courts are um, getting more and more critical of employers around terminations, recognizing the whole, it's so upsetting for the employee and the capital offense issue. Um, what there is evolving is a duty to be honest in a gentle way. And what I mean by that is, don't make up a reason for termination that doesn't exist. If somebody's being terminated for performance reasons, the time of termination is not the time to get into a detailed explanation. We're terminating your employment because on this date we warned you and on this date you didn't come in and that's not the time. The termination meeting should be very short, it should be very professional, and essentially you should not misrepresent things. If you don't want to raise the reason for termination, if it's a without cause termination, you don't have to. Just say, look, it's time we parted ways. I realize this is upsetting for you. Here's a, a termination letter. It'll set out all the details around your termination. Go away, look at it, think about it. We'll send you your personal items or in some cases you'll have the person go back to their desk. Be very careful about misrepresenting a reason for termination. And the reason I say that is if you tell somebody that you are restructuring, and they are inclined to file a human rights complaint, and you replace that position in a month, then you go to the human rights tribunal and you say, we told them it was restructuring, really it was performance-based, and here's the explanation for why we really terminated them. The tribunal is going to have significant difficulty with anything you say. So you don't have to necessarily tell them, but if you tell them, make it the real reason. Don't, don't say restructuring if it's not. So the question is, if you don't tell them, does it, does it uh, potentially leave you open to a human rights complaint? I don't think so. Uh, and the reason I say that is, um, if you don't give them any reason, and you say, look, we're terminating your employment without cause, there's nothing wrong with that. At, at law, you don't have to have a reason. So if you don't give them a reason, then, um, then when you go to the tribunal, you can say, yes, we didn't, we didn't explain it to the employee at the time because it was a termination without cause. Certainly, if it's a restructuring or if, it's, if there's an easy explanation for it, 
then absolutely. But telling somebody at the time of termination that it's performance-based can be difficult, and it can set somebody off in, the, in a direction you don't want them to go. I have a client who does it, who says, you know, we've been struggling with your performance for a while. We've decided to terminate your employment. Here's the letter. Read it. Think about it. You know, take whatever advice you see fit. There's nothing wrong with that. Be very, very careful about getting into a debate with an employee about the reasons for termination. And this is why raising performance at the time of termination um, can get you into trouble because the initial reaction of the employee is to challenge it, is to say, well, why? You know, I wasn't given my fair due, blah, 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 blah. And if you go down that rabbit hole, you're going to sit in a meeting with somebody for 20 minutes and they're going to become increasingly upset and you're not going to convince them. I have yet to hear an employer say, you know, I terminated somebody and I explained the reasons for termination and it was performance-based and they agreed with me at the end. You're not going to get the person to agree with you, so keep it short. And in fairness to the person, it's, gonna, it's, it's typically bad news for anyone. Occasionally somebody loves getting a severance package, but for most people it's bad news. And so the idea is to get them out as quickly as you can. So that ties in with keep the meeting short. Yeah, so the question is, isn't it, isn't it best to have a robust performance management system so that when you go to termination, you've got a good amount of documentation behind you in case they raise a human rights complaint? And that's absolutely true. You know, the fact that you end up terminating, and this is something that, that managers often have a hard time understanding, the fact that you have um, performance managed somebody exceptionally well and then decided to terminate without cause is not a failing. Sometimes you look at somebody and you say, okay, we've performance managed them, we've pointed out where they went wrong, we've tried to assist them, we've given them tools to assist, but they're just not there. That is a fantastic backup uh, way to, to terminate because as you say, if the person then files a human rights complaint, you've got all of the documentation behind you to support uh, the real reason for termination and the fact that it's not uh, due to a human rights ground. Certainly, the fact that you terminate somebody without cause is not in itself a human rights ground, but to the extent you don't have any documentation and you terminate without cause, if the person is able to provide a compelling case for a human rights complaint, you're going to be in a lot more trouble than if you've got a robust um, uh, performance management program so that you can say, look, over the past year, you know, we pointed out on your performance evaluation last year that you had issues. You know, nine months ago we followed up on those issues, six months ago we followed up on those issues, three months ago we followed up on them. Yes, we terminated without cause, but we certainly had sufficient grounds to terminate. And that's the difference between cause and legitimate reasons. Um, so generally speaking, uh, um, except in exceptional circumstances, uh, this is probably the last time you're going to see the employee, so make sure the letter of termination and if you're offering a severance package over the ESA, a release is attached. Um, make sure that in your severance packages, you make clear that you will provide employment standards minimums even if they don't sign back the release. You can't withhold employment standards minimums until they sign a release unless you're alleging cause. Um, uh, stay professional, I think that probably goes without saying. The, not, the, the fact that this is not a negotiation is important. Sometimes you get people who want to challenge you, who want to discuss it. And the, the maxim I always come back to is, I know this is upsetting, I know this isn't news that you want to hear, but the decision is final. So I, I think it's best if you take this, if you read it, give it some time and get back to us. The, the idea in most cases is to really get the person to accept the decision, not to debate with them. Um, always make sure that you have IT and security in place. Um, you want to make sure that access to any IT systems is cut off while you're in the meeting or exactly after the meeting. You know, I had one client who forgot to shut off the remote access and the employee was able to get access that night from home. You know, suing the employee after they've gone in and deleted a bunch of stuff is not the ideal result. Um, 
you have to think about how you're going to handle the return of your property and the return of their property. Often an employee will have a laptop, may have other property of yours that they have at your home. Um, often you can do that by way of courier pickup or something of that nature. Um, but if you've got something particularly sensitive, you may have to take uh, time to consider that. Um, you also have to make sure, and, and this has come up in a couple of cases where the employer, frankly, just um, missed paying out the statutory amounts. All the employment standards legislation in Canada has time periods within which termination pay and in Ontario severance pay has to be paid. So make sure you meet those time periods and that payroll is aware of two things. First, that they have to make the ASA payments. Second, make sure they know to cut the employee off salary. <laughs> I've seen it happen more than once where an employee a year or two later uh, is faced with a, a demand letter from one of my clients who says, you've been receiving your salary for a year and you didn't tell us, you have to pay it back. Believe it or not, it happens. So make sure that payroll is fully aware of it. Um, and then again, you know, like the benefit continuance, you have to meet the ESA in Ontario, uh, and then whatever the severance offer you're going to make um, in relation to the termination. So with that, we will turn it over to uh, questions. Um, yeah? Yeah. So the Hydro One, uh, the question was, how did the Hydro One reinstatement come about? That was an arbitrator's decision. So the employee was unionized and filed a grievance, and the grievance went through the arbitration process. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, on that front, uh, again, this is the difference between unionized and non-union. Uh, outside of the human rights world, because human rights, the human rights tribunal does have the power to reinstate, but non-union. If somebody's terminated for cause, for example, uh, they can bring a civil lawsuit, but in the absence of a discrimination complaint, they can't get reinstated. All they can get is damages. So severance package, punitives, all that kind of great stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything you want yeah, to Yeah, and I haven't seen the actual decision yet either. I don't think it's um, yet available, but it'll be, it will be an interesting read, I'm sure. <laughs> and we'll likely see the application of the five-part test that always makes an appearance in off-duty context. Yep, at the side there. Yeah, that that's a very good question. I'll so just, so it. just, oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. No, no. Uh, the question was whether um, an employee's efforts to sort of undo the damage caused by their uh, offensive off-duty conduct, whether that can have an effect on the ultimate decision that's made by uh, the arbitrator or the judge. And absolutely, um, in the both the firefighter case and the TDSB case that um, we discussed, the employee's efforts to sort of make amends and to demonstrate an intention to sort of um, attend, whether it's a, a sort of sensitivity training or to write letters of apology, those were explicit factors that were considered in, in both of those decisions and I think are always going to be fairly relevant considerations. Unfortunately, in the firefighter scenario, um, the letters of apology <laughs> left a lot to be desired. <laughs> I'm and, sorry I got caught. <laughs> yeah, essentially, um, and and weren't, uh, were determined not to be very uh, sincere. And then in the TDSB situation, it was determined that actually the employee had gone around um, trying to convince some of the student witnesses to sort of change their story about what had transpired, <laughs> um, tried to convince one of them to claim that, you know, he had heard this student threaten the, the parent. So obviously, it didn't do much to help themselves <laughs> in those situations, but absolutely those are, are relevant considerations. Yeah. Any, Any other questions? questions? Okay, well, please make sure that you fill out your evaluations. As I said, they are extremely helpful to us. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the day and uh, enjoy your next session. Thank you very much. Thank you.